When I was a kid, and when I was brought in 1967 by my relatives to Tunisia, no one could imagine that the Arab Spring will start from Tunisia. It did. Today, as the consequences of the Arab Spring, we still that uh, this process has an impact on the situation in the Middle East and North Africa. The developments in Egypt, Tunisia, Syria, and Libya show that the process is still ongoing. Moreover, the Arab Spring has had an adverse effect on the situation in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mali's territorial integrity was put at risk, and we now hear about the appearance of the green arc of extremism from the Sahel to the Horn of Africa. The regional situation became so tense as to make Russia accept the French military operation to counter the extremists in Mali. The extremism in sub-Saharan Africa is fueled by the firearms from Libyan arsenals and the manpower of militants that fought in Libya. I will never forget how I came to Timbuktu right before the uh, events, right before the coup d'etat in Mali, and I spent a day talking to tribal and religious leaders eating a seven-year-old mutton, which was very difficult to chew, and drinking wonderful Castel beer. Uh, and one of the tribal leaders said to me, what happened in Libya ruined my business. I said, what do you mean ruined your business? I said, today you can buy a Soviet-made man, uh, man pad for the price of two used Kalashnikovs. And it's not a joke. And it's not a joke. If you go to that region, you can see uh, all these so-called Land Cruiser-based movements moving uh, from one place to another. And if you can count the arms in each Land Cruiser, you can really see that the uh, problem of arms trafficking in that part of the world is a serious problem. Initially, it seemed inevitable that the uh, dictatorial regimes in North Africa will be replaced by the Islamist ones. Experts referred to the history of the region where free elections would result in a theocracy. This time, the trend continued as the Islamists won the elections in Egypt and in Tunisia. But the major driving force behind them was the modern-minded social groups, primarily the youth. The Islamists won the election. Uh, the uh, Islamists pri uh, prioritized the creeping Islamization of their countries over the social and economic issues that sparked the Arab Spring. Moreover, with reference to democracy and legitimacy, the radical part of the Muslim Brotherhood declared a total jihad, started to pursue dissidents, blow up Christian churches, and so on. This policy resulted in the overthrow of the Islamist president in Egypt and the crackdown of the Muslim Brotherhood. In Tunisia, we have so far seen only peaceful demonstrations and uh, of secular-minded opposition. But the social and economic environment there is unstable. The situation can only be improved through a rational policy. Libya as a state remains, to a certain extent, a chaos. The Islamists are believed to have seized control from the country's leadership. However, the former pro-Qaddafi fighters uh, that have left Libya are now saying, with reference to internal uh, secular forces, that the Islamists have no prospects in the country. The new opposition takes a wait-and-see approach, and it expects the new Libyan regime to collapse on its own. The Syrian president, Bashar al-Assad, called the overthrow of the Egyptian president, Mohamed Morsi, the fall of what is known as political Islam, quote. It is obviously an overstatement, as the future of Arab Renaissance in the Middle East and North Africa is still uncertain. 
In Egypt, for example, the number of those supporting a theocracy almost equals the number of those in favor of secular state. Furthermore, behind moderate Islam Islamists, there goes a second echelon of extremists and militants. For instance, Tunisia is witnessing a struggle of three opposing forces, the ruling moderate Islamists, the secular opposition, and the Salafists. In addition, political conflicts in the Middle East and North Africa are reinforced by a religious one, a confrontation between Shias and Sunnis. This is also reflected in the region's political landscape. Shia Iran is a staunch supporter of the Alawi Syrian president, while Saudi Arabia and Turkey competing for the leadership in the Sunni world back the Syrian opposition. At the outset of the Arab Spring, the Russian stance on the issue, though more moderate than the position of the US and France, for example, coincided to a great extent with that of the West. Even at that time, Russia opposed foreign interference in the internal affairs of the riot-hit countries. Russia believed that the situation in each country of the region had to be resolved through political means avoiding violence and civil war. That stance was prompted by a history of attempts to impose democracy on Islamic countries such as Iraq and Afghanistan through intervention. The efforts ended in failed states rather than democracy. When hostilities in Libya broke out, Russia took a tougher stance running counter to that of the West. I acted as a mediator in the conflict between Benghazi and Tripoli as a special representative of the Russian president for cooperation with African countries for a certain period of time. We were strongly supporting what President Jacob Zuma of South Africa was doing, implementing the strategy of the African Union at that time. Uh, the decision uh, of my first trip to, to Benghazi was made on the margins of the G8 summit in Deauville. I visited both uh, Benghazi and Tripoli several times, yet the situation was deadlocked. One of the reasons was that personal enmity towards Gaddafi in Benghazi prevailed over all rational approaches and any, negotia and any negotiations were uh, conditioned on his stepping down. Russia's attitude towards the Arab Spring is sometimes labeled as the Cold War legacy. Allegedly, Russia lacks confidence in Arab countries' capability to build democracy. That is not so. Russia believes that democracy should be an internal choice of these countries rather than imposed from outside by bayonets. In, adi in addition, the Arab democracy takes on specific cultural and civilizational features, which Western experts tag as liberal democracy. Thus, it is a matter of reasonably taking in consideration specific cultural and historic features of Arab countries rather than lacking confidence in their abilities. It should be noted that in the Arab world, there is no democracy that would meet Western criteria. Does this imply that a no-fly zone should be established in all Arab countries, deposing the dictators in uh, other parts of the world at the same time? In general, Russia's attitude towards North Africa and the Middle East reflects the official principles of its foreign policy. They include comprehensive efforts to strengthen peace, security, and stability, democratization of international system, collective decision-making in addressing global issues, the primacy of international law, and the central role of the United Nations. Russia's foreign policy gives special attention to safeguarding sovereignty. Therefore, the International Coalition's interpretation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1973 on Libya scandalized Russian diplomats. It is our firm belief that NATO has no authority, had no authority to bring down political regimes. The intent of Russia's position on the Middle East and North Africa is to struggle to uphold international law. The lack of such respect will plunge the world into turmoil and makes it slip into a permanent state of emergency. When addressing internal conflicts, 
Russia refers not only to the UN, but also to relevant regional bodies, such as the African Union, the ECOWAS in case of Mali, and the GCC for Yemen. Today, Russia is coming back to many regions uh, it lost in the 90s. I'm talking about the African continent and the Middle East. Russia was quite explicit about its interest in those regions even before the Arab Spring, when it began to strengthen military, technical, and trade and economic cooperation with regional countries such as Syria, Egypt, Libya, plus Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. The revolution in Libya has led to de facto lost contracts concluded with the former regime. The current government, however, has not declared force majeure, thus de jure, those contacts are still in force. For instance, the Russian Railways Company built a railway between Libya and uh, Benghazi and Sirt, but suspended the construction in 2011 for the reasons anyone, uh, anyone knows now. Today, the company is negotiating with the Libyan authorities the possibility to renew the project if the domestic situation allows. In other words, Russia is ready for cooperation with uh, new leaders in North Africa on earlier and uh, fresh contracts. In mid-November 2013, Russia and Egypt held a 2 plus 2 ministerial meeting in Cairo. The minister's efforts have helped the Russian-Egyptian Intergovernmental Commission on Trade and Economic Cooperation to resume its work. The Russian side made proposals on investment cooperation in energy and heavy industry. The both countries have started to develop a legal framework for military and technical cooperation suspended under President Sadat. Russia will provide Egypt with military equipment valued at 2 billion US dollars, which has been recently refused to them by the United States of America. Although our relations have been suspended for some considerable time, Egypt continues to view Russia as a reliable partner. The 2 plus 2 meeting reached understanding that peoples of North Africa and the Middle East should determine their own future without external interference. Besides, the Egyptian and Russian parties discussed the Syrian crisis on the basis of these positions as well. I was preparing this message in the midst of debates over the Geneva II conference. The National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary Forces decided to participate in this conference. With regard to the Syrian events, the world community divided into two camps. The West and the developing countries, China, India, South Africa, Brazil, and Iran support Russia's position on Syria. The opinion uh, on the world order that is being shaped in these countries differs from the Western one. Russia has its interests in the Middle East as a whole, and in Syria in particular. It is the biggest supplier of arms to Syria, worth about $4 billion, and as a matter of, of fact, this country is Russia's ally in the region. You do not abandon, uh, give your allies and the Libyan scenario, according to uh, Russia's view on the recent Libya's experience, will destroy Syria. It may lead to aggravation of the situation and direct involvement of other uh, regional and international players in the conflict. And the hotbed of terrorism that will emerge in the Syrian territory will spread beyond the region up to the former Soviet republics in Central Asia and some parts of the Russian Federation. Today, the West is assisting the Syrian opposition with arms, but in case of military intervention, this assistance will acquire a direct combat character. Meanwhile, the members of the terrorist groups associated with Al-Qaeda are fighting in the ranks of the Syrian opposition. It is known that the militants of the Syrian National Front are fighting on the side of the opposition in Syria along with the Free Syrian Army. These are the groups of Ahrar al-Sham, uh, and uh, at least more, more than that, six or seven different other groups. They are considered as the radical Islamists, while Jabhat al-Nusra is recognized as a terrorist group by the United States of America. The reasons why the West supports its worst enemies in Syria are not clear, as well as the reasons why the United States of America supports the Muslim Brotherhood. After uh, Mohammed Morsi's overthrow, the Americans refused to render military assistance to the new Egyptian authorities, 
contrary to Israel's position on this issue. Therefore, Cairo is uh, diversified its relations with the help of Moscow, Beijing, and other BRICS countries. The Russian initiative to transfer chemical weapons, uh, uh, Syrian chemical weapons, uh, and uh, to place it under the international control, as well as destroy its arsenals, backed off the red line drawn in Washington, beyond which the U.S. planned to attack the Syrian military targets. By the way, these plans were not supported in the, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and in the U.K. Parliament. And not only in these countries, particularly, nobody was ready to fight in Syria, especially without a UN sanction. Thus, the Russian initiative turned out to become a good way out for all parties concerned. And today, according to observers, the grand diplomacy is emerging to solve the Syrian issue, first of all, by joint efforts of the Russian Federation and the United States of America. This is an inspiring cooperation of the parties amid uh, the conflict of interests on the European missile system, Iran, integration of the CIS countries, Magnitsky case and other cases. Russia's firm position on Syria stems from the fact that the future responses are, uh, of the world community to intrastate conflicts depend on the model of the Syrian crisis solution. Russia insists on diplomatic settlement of such conflicts rather than military one, as has already been the practice. The Russian and U.S. diplomatic experience leaves no doubt about it. If diplomacy fails to solve the Syrian conflict, the devastating civil and at the same time religious war will continue in Syria. This will make a hellish mixture of Libyan, Iraqi, Lebanese, and Afghan options, while Syria will become a terrorist camp posing a threat far beyond the region. The terrorist threat is an important factor influencing Russia's position in the Middle East. But Russia's interests are threatened not only by the export of terrorism, but also by the spread of nuclear weapons to the south of its borders. That is why Russia stands for making the Middle East a nuclear-free zone and solving the Iran nuclear dossier problems in a diplomatic way. The ideal solution would be to create a common security system in the region. However, the relations between the states and different uh, religions are so tense here that any agreement nowadays is difficult, if not impossible. Summing up uh, my introductory remarks, I would like to mention again when Russia is talking about its foreign policy in the Middle East and Africa, Russia is talking about it as a responsible member of the inter international community, as a P5 member country, which shares responsibility for what is happening in uh, this part of the globe with other P5 member states. We do not want to be part of a problem in any political crisis. We want to be part of a solution, and I think that in Syrian crisis,